How hops and majestic magpies, welcome to Vignettes and Vigilantes, a podcast about films in the DC animated universe. I'm your host, RK Muse, and today we're looking at The Departed, a 2006 film directed by Martin Scorsese and based on the 2002 Hong Kong film Infernal Affairs. The Departed follows two Bostonians as they seek to find a mole in a criminal organization and a mole in the police station, each man working for a different boss. But without any further ado, let's nosedive into it. The Departed begins with neighborhood crime boss Frank Costello stepping into a luncheonette and collecting money from the manager. He notices a grade schooler, Colin Sullivan, sitting at the counter. While making a pass at the young lady behind the counter, Frank buys Colin groceries and a comic book. He encourages the lad to stay in school, but if Colin wants to make some extra money, come to Frank. On top of his studies and impending criminal activities, Colin is also an altar boy, but don't be surprised, his last name is Sullivan and he's from Boston. He's more than likely going to be Catholic. While giving Colin and the other kids a lecture, Frank tells them that a man makes his own way and nothing, I mean nothing, will be handed to him. We then catch a glimpse of Frank's day job, namely murdering a couple with his associate, Mr. French. As a plane flies over Logan, Frank and Mr. French laugh about how the woman fell when she was shot in the head. Sick fuck. As the flashback to the 1970s close out, Frank tells Colin that whether cop or criminal, when facing down a loaded gun, what's the difference? And that's the first exploration into the themes of this narrative. And just like that, Colin has grown up and is a student in the police academy with dreams and ambitions always in front of him. We then get to meet another young man hoping to be a cop. This is our other central character, Billy Costigan, and he is introduced filling out one of his exams with confidence. During this time, we get to meet Berrigan, a friend of Colin's, and Brown, a friend of Billy's, both of whom also have goals of becoming state troopers. Eventually, graduation comes along, and Colin is now an official Massachusetts state trooper, which Frank and Mr. French observe from a distance. However, Colin's career path is not just limited to being a state trooper. He is eventually promoted to the Special Investigations Unit, an area in the Boston Police Department overseen by Captain Oliver Queenan. Queenan welcomes Colin aboard, flanked by his colleague and de facto sidekick, Sergeant Sean Dingham. Once Colin leaves, Billy is called into Queenan's office. Dingham acts like a dick to Billy as they review the Costigan family's less-than-sterling reputation, which includes Billy having two criminal uncles and his own slew of anger problems. Can you blame Billy, though? I'd be pretty angry if I didn't have enough room on that door. Colin announces to Berrigan, now also a trooper, that he received the slick new SIU promotion. He's also busy eye-fucking every lady in the building as he is debriefed by Captain George Ellerby, his new boss. The Special Investigations Unit, or SIU, seeks to break down organized crime in Boston, namely the Frank Costello outfit. We get to meet a variety of criminals who work for Frank, which includes Fitzgibbon, Delahunt, and Mr. French, who we've already met. Just to let you know, Fitzgibbons goes by Fitzy. Colin looks subtly excited in the scene, probably because he knows every single person on that slideshow. Dingham's interrogation of Billy continues, and the seasoned officer asks Billy how come he's pretending to be a cop. He also brings up Billy's middle-class upbringing with his mother while his father lived in the projects and worked as a baggage handler at Logan. There is certainly a class divide which Dingham holds against Billy. A tad unfair, and Dingham wonders why a lace curtain Irish-American is desiring a job as a cop when he could have been an architect or something. Queenan then asks, in a more subdued and controlled tone, if Billy truly wants to be a cop or if he just wants to appear as a cop. A fiery Dingham and a quieter Queenan both agree, however, that Billy is never going to be a cop. They do agree that he's smart, but without much family. And we certainly learn why Billy doesn't have much family. His beloved mother is dying from a terminal illness, most likely cancer, and her brother, Billy's uncle, only seems concerned about her because it's the end, rather than appreciating her while she was alive. Billy takes offense to this, and it's made abundantly clear that he doesn't want to constantly associate himself with his dad's side of the family or his mom's side of the family. At his mother's funeral, a weeping Billy stands by himself. He continues to stand watch later on and comes across a bouquet of flowers from F. Costello. Uh Uh-oh. There is also a message on a card that reads, Heaven Holds the Faithful Departed. That's the name of the movie! Colin by now is touring an apartment across the gold-domed Massachusetts State House. That's probably a pretty penny in terms of rent and security deposits. The leasing representative asks Colin if he's married since it's such a big place. Fucking nosy. But Colin's illegal activities bring in more than enough to cover three times the monthly rate, and he gets that lease signed. Nowhere to go but up, I guess. Back at the Boston Police Department, though, Billy Costigan has nowhere to go. Not even up. Knowing his police dreams are dashed, he asks Queenan and Dingham what his options are. The two cops tell Billy that he can be an informant working his way into Frank Costello's outfit. Billy will take the fall for an assault charge, which makes sense given his childhood indiscretions. 
As shipping up to Boston by the dropkick Murphys plays in all its Irish and screamo glory, Billy is booked into jail, processed, and is seen working out like Max Cady, while Colin enjoys his view of the Massachusetts State House. Once he is released, Billy heads to his aunt's house and tells her that he was kicked out of the state police. His cousin Sean, who has a reputation for being a two-bit dope dealer, greets Billy. We last saw Sean as Henry Hill's wheelchair-using brother Michael in another Scorsese classic, Goodfellas, but instead of being driven by a cokehead, he's now purveying coke. Sean informs Billy that an old acquaintance of theirs, Miles Kennefick, was recently killed, having been a figure in Frank Costello's mob. Billy and Sean decide to do some business together, which was all Billy's plan to get noticed by Frank Costello. As they drive through the streets of Boston, Sean does business with Mr. French, which does not go unnoticed by Billy. Sometime later, Billy goes to the bar and orders a cranberry juice, which shows he's got a few things in common with Sergeant Nicholas Angle, although, come to think of it, Angle might have been a typo. The barfly sitting next to Billy asks if Billy is on his period since he's drinking the elixir of the gods. Honestly, though, cranberry juice is amazing for maintaining the health of the vagina, so the more you know. But Billy does not want to discuss menstrual health with this clown, so he smashes his glass over the barfly's head, starting a little fight, which Mr. French immediately quashes. Mr. French tells Billy that he can't just start swinging on anybody. He also takes time to tell Billy that he shouldn't do business with his idiotic cousin. As Billy calms down, Mr. French asks him what he was drinking. Billy says cranberry juice, and Mr. French, in all seriousness, asks if Billy was on his period. Go figure. Dingham joins a meeting with Captain Ellerby, and the two josh each other with the old fuck your wife, how's your mother route. Dingham informs the cop under Ellerby's command that Frank Costello is doing business with China's criminal underbelly. After a few more acidic words, Dingham leaves, and Ellerby tells us that he's usually a good guy. Eh, take what you can get, I guess. Colin and Berrigan question Mrs. Kennefick, mother of the recently deceased Miles. She is tight-lipped and doesn't take kindly to Colin's questions. She immediately clams up when she spots Frank, Mr. French, and Frank's lover driving up to intimidate her from a distance. She slams the door in Colin and Berrigan's faces. Back at the police station, Colin is in a crowded elevator when he begins flirting with Madeline Madden, a psychiatrist in the police department. She can whoop the ass, both spiritually and physically, of any demon. Colin and Madeline flirt with each other, and Colin goes the extra mile by saying he'd stab someone in the heart so he could see her professionally. Dial it back, dude, she's already interested. At the old neighborhood luncheonette from the prologue, now under new management, a pair of wise guys are harassing the shop owner, with Billy watching nearby. Billy beats the shit out of these two wise guys, injuring his own hand in the process, but the shop owner orders him to leave. He's got a business to run, after all. Billy heads to the emergency room to get treatment as Colin and Madeline go on their first date. Colin and Madeline discuss the feelings aspect of her job, with Colin even telling her that the Irish are impervious to psychoanalysis. He asks her how she came to be a shrink in Boston of all places, probably the most Irish-inclined city in the country, and Madeline gives an honest response. Sometimes her patients do get better. She's also in good industry company, what with Fraser Crane, at least before he moved to Seattle, and Lilith Sternin. Billy, with his bandaged hand, is finally sipping a cranberry juice in peace. Frank Costello slides onto the stool beside him and introduces himself. Mr. French and Fitzy are watching from a, di a distance, ready to jump in whenever Frank needs them. Frank then orders Billy to join him in a private room. Once joined by Mr. French and Fitzy, Frank informs Billy that the two men that Billy assaulted were connected to a crime family in Providence. This also means they're going to come after Billy and, uh, kill him. Frank decides to have Billy searched, and Billy, on his request, removes his shoes and allows himself to be leaned over the pool table, where Mr. French for thoroughly checks him for weapons and contraband. Frank tells Billy that he's familiar with Billy's father, distracting him long enough for Mr. French to smash open Billy's cast. Frank then wonders if Billy is a rat in the state police, looking for a way to expose Frank's criminal activities. With a stunning amount of composure for a hot-blooded criminal, Frank smashes Billy's boot over the young man's splintered hand, telling Billy to swear on his mother's fresh grave that he's not a cop. Billy obliges and then breaks down in tears as pain and panic, my favorite Disney sidekicks, begin to sink in. Frank pats Billy's shoulder and tosses a few bills his way, telling him to get fixed up. Privately, Frank asks Mr. French if Billy is trustworthy. Mr. French says he'd gladly vouch for Billy, but Frank is uncomfortable about trusting a man who has nothing to lose. However, Mr. French is steadfastly confident in Billy. Soon after, the two Providence wise guys are found brutally murdered, discovered by Colin Sullivan. He takes a call from Madeline at the crime scene and says that he needs to see her since he's traumatized from finding a dead body. I believe that's what the youth calls Riz. Later on, he calls Frank, who listens to this call while indoctrinating Billy into the criminal life. Billy tells Frank that he wants to earn more money on the street, and Frank casually pulls out a bloodied hand as though he were Oswald Cobblepot in the sewers of Gotham City. I mean, 
Frank was the Joker. Those two villains do talk to each other. As a fearful Billy looks on, Frank nonchalantly removes a ring from the severed hand and gives both to Mr. French, instructing his colleague to send the ring to the dead guy's wife. Charming. Shortly after this, Billy takes refuge in a bathroom and furiously removes the awkward wire he'd been wearing. Dingham, who had been listening in with Queen Anne, wonders if Billy is dead already, but no, he's not dead, just frustrated. Billy refuses to wear a wire, since wires are usually dead giveaways that a person is a rat. As Billy lets off steam, Queen Anne calmly tells Billy to listen for the word microprocessors, which Frank is again allegedly pilfering with the Chinese underworld. Colin's police work goes on as normal, discussing crime stuff with Ellerby. He hand chooses his A-team, which includes Troopers Berrigan and Brown. Billy is kind of floundering in the criminal life, though. Mr. French is beating the tar out of a debtor, and Billy tries to fit in by thwacking his gun against the face of another debtor. Billy assumed that this man was reaching into his jacket for a gun, but in actuality, the man, who is now bleeding from the mouth, was reaching for his fucking cigarettes. A flustered Billy stammers a non-answer as Mr. French continues his beatdown. Billy is then chastised by Frank at the same time Colin is telling his A-team that Costello has a rat in the Boston Police Department. However, Colin's team will not have the access to the identities and files of the undercover agents who report directly to Captain Queenan. Frank throws some more orders Billy's way and then calls Colin, who tells his daddy that he was promoted. While at a restaurant, Frank tells Billy about his angry father. Billy Costigan Sr. never wanted any money, dirty or otherwise, even though his brothers ran, ran around in unsavory crowds. However, Costigan Sr. cared about his son in his own unique way, which would have resulted in him going ballistic if he knew Billy Jr. was running around with Frank Costello. A protective parent can be just as scary as a wild bear. After this sobering conversation, Frank asks if Billy would ever go back to school. Billy says, fuck no, school's for losers. And Frank says he hopes Billy will wake up one day. I guess we know Frank Costello is an education advocate. Back with the SIU now, Fitzy is in an interrogation room while Colin, Brown, and Berrigan discuss the situation. Colin pretends to be Fitzy's lawyer and encourages his partners to turn off the cameras in the interrogation room. Colin and Fitzy do a cloak and dagger routine, with Colin instructing Fitzy to call his mother. Fitzy does so, with Mr. French taking the call. Mr. French realizes what's going on and instructs everyone to move out. He also burns down the shack they'd been using for packing drugs. Billy watches the Inferno while Colin instructs Brown to run the last call that was made on Fitzy's phone so they can get a search warrant. Colin Sullivan is the personification of Mac's famous quote, I'm playing both sides so that I always come out on top. Colin and Madeline's relationship continues to grow, but the two have an awkward night. It appears Colin had a touch of impotence and is highly embarrassed. Madeline kindly tells him that it's really not a big deal and that it happens to dozens of men. However, Colin tersely says he needs to get to work. Billy, on the other hand, is miserable for another reason. He feels immense fear and guilt after helping Mr. French commit a murder. He's been in a depressive episode, staring at his mother's possessions and self-medicating with Oxy and a Sprite chaser. He's clearly under a lot of strain, and when Madeline doesn't give him the repartee or pharmaceuticals he desires, he loses it at her. He asks her if her cop patients cry during their sessions, and when she says they do, Billy declares that they only do that because it's expected of them. He then tells her that nobody is more full of shit than a cop. We then get a glimpse into Billy's relationships with Dingham and Queenan. Billy doesn't like the undercover life and gets into a near fist fight with Dingham. After the two are calmed down by Queenan, Billy wearily asks why Frank can't be arrested on the thousand and one other crimes he's committed. Queenan patiently tells Billy that they're building a case, which takes a lot of time, and that there is most likely a mole in the police department. He promises that they're getting closer and closer to the finish line, but I'm skeptical. Back in Madeline's office, Billy tells her he's been having panic attacks and needs Valium. Madeline takes offense to this and closes up his file, which enrages Billy to the point where he questions her compassion for her patients. Madeline spitefully hands him two small pills, and Billy loses it again, leading to her telling him to get out. Once he's gone, though, she realizes her mistake and writes a prescription, complete with her business card. However, she tells Billy that he's a classic fit for drug-seeking behavior and that she's transferring him to another counselor. Billy asks if she'd like to get coffee with him, but we don't get a hard and fast response from Madeline. While waiting for criminal business, Ellerby gives his team a rundown on the microprocessors and the impending transfer between Frank and the Chinese mob. Before shutting off his phone, Colin takes a call from Costello, which Queenan notices. Ellerby and Queenan inform us that all cell phone signals are under tight surveillance with the federal liaisons. However, Colin is able to send a quick message to Frank, which says, No phones. Frank, Mr. French, Fitzy, Delahunt, and Billy roll up to the transfer. Frank receives Colin's message and covertly tells his associates to turn off their cell phones. Frank is able to make the transfer by standing in the camera's blind spot. 
Realizing that they have no real proof of the deal, Ellerby loses his shit and attacks one of the technicians. The next day, Billy calls Dingham, though he was expecting Queenan, and tells him to issue a warrant for Frank's apartment. However, he is to tell only the Special Investigations Unit about the warrant, and then they'll find the rat. Dingham doesn't take him too seriously, and later, Billy is seen on a date with Madeline. The two discuss her serious relationship with Colin, and Madeline candidly says that every couple has their peaks and valleys, and right now, she and Colin are in a valley. She also says that if Colin saw her with Billy, she would lie about the nature of their business. Yeesh. To further complicate things, Colin and Madeline have decided to move in together. Madeline has brought over a childhood picture of herself, which Colin immediately rejects. The two begin acting like a couple, which culminates in Madeline answering a phone. Unfortunately, her lighthearted response is not appreciated, and she hands the phone over to Colin. It's Frank, who is irate that Colin isn't answering his cell phone. He makes several lewd and threatening remarks about Madeline to Colin, showing that Colin is pretty much whipped where Frank is concerned. Frank's irascibility is then further explained when he tells Colin he thinks there's a rat in his crew. Colin reiterates that he doesn't have access to Queenan's undercover files. He instructs Frank to get information, like social security numbers and bank account info, from last night's crew. Back in the world of Frank Costello and criminal stuff, Billy is interrogating an associate. The associate breaks down in tears and says that Frank is working with the FBI. A stunned Billy demands the associate repeat himself, but the associate is too scared. Billy decides to encourage him by shooting a round into his kneecap. The associate then reveals that Frank is a protected informant with the FBI, which changes everything. Billy shows up at Queenan's front yard and brings the older cop up to speed. Queenan invites Billy inside, covertly of course, and tells Billy to spill the beans. Frank, on the other hand, is having a red light night with two women who he plies with cocaine and sex. Later on, Billy is summoned by Frank. He shows up to the meeting area and is instructed by Mr. French to write down his social security number and bank account information. Billy does so with Fitzy, who has been instructed to write Citizen's Trust across an envelope. Fitzy spells it incorrectly, and Billy writes down the correct spelling on top of the envelope. After he writes down his information and submits it, Billy heads to visit Madeline, who is packing up the last of her possessions before moving in with Colin. Billy notices the framed picture of Madeline as a child, but rather than tell her to hide the picture, he instead hangs it higher on the wall, showing he's not nearly as closed off as Colin. Billy and Madeline then have an intimate conversation that turns into an intimate lovemaking session set to Pink Floyd's Comfortably Numb, and let's just say, Billy does not have the impotence that plagues Colin. Speaking of Colin, he is golfing with Ellerby and talking about the mole in the Special Investigations Unit. After moving past this conversation topic, Ellerby commends Colin about his growing relationship with Madeline. Ellerby says that a married cop looks cleaner than a young single cop, and that's probably one of the reasons why Colin wants to wife Madeline. After all, the cleaner he looks, the less likely he is to be fingered as Costello's mole. Right? Across town, Billy covertly watches Frank leave the Citizens Trust Bank with the similarly named envelope of account information. Colin heads to an adult theater, but he won't be chatting with the decaying corpse of Jack Goodman. Instead, he is approached by a man bent forward, slapping the salami. But never fear, it's just Frank wielding a dildo. What a stinker. The other patrons turn around as if to tell him to shut up, but Frank and Qu Colin quiet down and begin discussing Colin's recent fuck-ups. Billy watches from a shadowy distance in the theater, but can't quite figure out the identity of Frank's mole. Colin tells Frank to lay low in the meantime, while Billy is instructed by Queenan over text to get a visual ID of the suspect. Frank hands over the Citizens Trust bank account information to Colin and reminds his young protege to find the rat in the department. Colin tells Frank to trust him, going the Aladdin route, I see, and says that he can lie through his teeth as he's done it before. Frank bids Colin adieu and leaves. Colin leaves shortly after Frank and then is closely tailed by Billy. Unfortunately, Billy only catches fleeting glimpses of Colin's face as Colin disappears into the crowd. Colin seems to be aware he's being followed, and the two separate when Billy's phone goes off. Billy is instructed to make an arrest while Colin hides behind a truck, his knife out, and ready to stab. A delivery man comes around, and Colin stabs him in the chest by mistake. Billy walks down the alley searching for Colin, but Colin pops out and disappears into the crowds once again, though he notices a security camera recording his movements, which doesn't do a lot for his nerves. Colin is back at work, combing through footage on the aforementioned security camera. He sees Billy's outline, but because of the pixels, he can't make out a positive ID. He gathers his envelope of bank account information and carries it away. Billy then meets Frank at a restaurant, where Frank is sketching rats on the paper tablecloth. He's got great form. Those are very photorealistic rats. He tells Billy he smells a rat and spits brandy onto the paper tablecloth. How I wish Jack Nicholson got to repeat, We've been ratted out, boys. Frank mentions he's got an informant in his outfit. 
After a tense argument, Billy tells Frank that one of his guys is eventually going to kill him. Queenan and Colin discuss the rat in the police department, and Queenan informs Colin that his informant nearly caught the rat the previous evening. He tells Colin to follow Frank Costello, and then he'll find the rat. That night, Colin is thinking of his options with Madeline, like going to law school full-time or even leaving Boston behind. At work, he opens up the envelope of bank account information and begins entering in all the data. At a meeting, a casually blood-spattered Frank tells Billy to take the night off. Not always the best sign. And Billy then calls Queenan about Frank's new men being ushered in. Frank then discusses the situation with Colin, who orders constant surveillance around Queenan. Queenan is followed into the subway, where he takes a call from Billy, who is riding the same train. Queenan thinks the thought of being followed is ludicrous, but Billy is worried about him. He sends Queenan an address, 344 Wash, over text. The two meet on the roof of 344 Wash, where Billy tells Queenan that drugs are moving in, which Frank will handle. Billy also says that Frank is getting spooky. Overlook spooky or Joker spooky, spooky Billy? There's a distinction. Regardless, Billy is certain that Frank will kill him sooner or later. Colin is seen calling Frank, saying that Queenan is meeting with the rat as they speak. Frank then calls Delahunt and tells him to get the crew moving. Queenan says the FBI can't do anything as Billy receives a call from Delahunt, who tells him the rat is going to be discovered. Billy tells Queenan that they were followed by Costello's people. They take refuge inside 344 Wash as the criminals move in. Queenan tells Billy to leave via the fire escape, and by doing so, Queenan will be able to buy him some time. As Billy reluctantly leaves, Queenan checks the area, crosses himself, and waits for Costello's men to arrive. When they do, they accost Queenan and throw him from the window where he falls to his death, spraying a passing Billy with blood. Though shocked and soon racked with guilt and grief, Billy is approached by Costello's men who order Billy into their van. Colin's men, who are still keeping tabs on Queenan, begin shooting at the Costello crew, which of course results in the criminal shooting at them, with Queenan's body between the two. After all, Colin and Billy have one foot in each world. Later on, Dingham is absolutely livid as he and Ellerby interrogate Colin over Queenan's death since, as we know, Colin ordered Queenan to be closely tailed. Dingham then attacks Colin after the latter says that Queenan was killed by his own informant. Dingham says that's bullshit. Beneath all his bravado, he never took Billy for a dishonest murderer. That's kind of sweet. Ellerby jumps in then, ordering Dingham to take a paid leave of absence. Across town, Fitzy interrogates Billy for his late arrival as Della Hunt, who had been wounded in the, in the shootout, lies bleeding on the couch. Della Hunt pulls Billy over and tells him that he thinks Billy is the rat. Della Hunt says he gave Billy the wrong address, but Billy showed up at the right one. Before Billy can silence him, Della Hunt dies, though this time not covered in acidic xenomorph blood. Maybe next time. Madeline leaves work and finds Billy waiting for her. After a tender hug, she tells him they can't be together. Billy can only tell her that he knows, while Colin pours over Queenan's personal effects, which includes a bloody cell phone that was somehow not crushed from that three-story dive. Colin sees the last number Queenan dialed and calls it. Billy's cop informant cell phone vibrates, which he picks up, but remains silent. Neither Colin nor Billy say a word. Billy hangs up, then gathers some possessions and redials. Colin picks up, and Billy asks for his identification, which Colin provides. After a tense back and forth, Colin asks Billy to come into the police station. Billy agrees to do so before hanging up. A news account reveals that Delahunt's body was found, but he has been identified as Officer Timothy Delahunt with the Boston Police Department. Fitzy is incredulous and embarrassed that Delahunt's body was found so fast. Frank is convinced it was a diversion, so he and his crew would stop searching for the cop mole in their outfit. He then chastises Fitzy for his poor body disposal methods as the crew, including Billy, head to their next business meeting. While in the car with Billy and Mr. French, Frank receives a call from Colin, who says that he has a police tail. Frank screams at Colin to get rid of the police tail, screaming so loud that he temporarily cuts off shipping up to Boston, which had been playing as background music. Mr. French, Billy, and Colin can tell that Frank is about to snap, but only Billy and Colin are worried. Colin then tells Ellerby, Brown, and Berrigan to stop the tale. He informs Ellerby that the cops following Queenan called him after Queenan met his grisly fate. Billy, Frank, and Mr. French swing by a shipping container where Frank personally inspects the drugs. Boston's finest show up as Billy proposes there was another smaller tale on Frank the entire time. As Frank's men move out, they are stopped by the police who whip out their gats and hold them up. Billy, however, is able to escape. Frank whips out his own gat as his men open fire. Mr. French calmly drives as dozens of Frank's men are killed, but Frank's loyal soldier takes a bullet to the chest, which causes him to crash the car. Frank is able to escape as an inferno engulfs the car. Mr. French shoots himself in the head to avoid burning alive. Frank manages to make it to safety, but he is badly wounded. He hears a ringing phone, which is traced to a nearby Colin. A furious Colin asks if Frank is an FBI informant. 
Vomiting blood, Frank says he never tattled on anyone who wouldn't be discovered by the feds soon enough. That's reassuring? Frank tells Colin that he'd never give the FBI Colin's name, but Colin isn't so sure. After a brief shootout, Colin manages to zing a bullet into Frank's chest and the crime boss finally dies, landing in some construction equipment rather unceremoniously. He does squeeze off a final round, though, which misses Colin, who returns the favor by emptying his magazine into Frank's torso. Frank's cell goes off and Colin answers, telling Frank's lover that the crime boss is dead. He hangs up as the other cops begin moving in, and Colin is, of course, hailed as a hero by the Boston Police Department. At the police station, Brown announces that Billy Costigan, an old classmate of his from the police academy, has been waiting for Colin. Now face to face for the per first time, Colin tells Billy he's recommending him for the Medal of Merit, but Billy can see right through Colin's act. Billy says he wants his identity back and then says he's going to find Costello's rat in the police department. Colin goes to enter Billy's information in a different computer, which gives Billy time to spot the Citizens Trust envelope on Colin's desk. Billy leaves the police station as Colin deletes Billy's record. Later on, Billy surprises Madeline with an envelope, telling her to open it either on his command or if something terrible happens to him. Madeline agrees to hold on to the envelope, but she also has something to tell Billy. He tells her to hold on to it for two weeks. In her office, Madeline writes Costigan across the envelope and tucks it away in her desk. She then wakes Colin in his apartment with another envelope, this one including an ultrasound snapshot. If you're not sure what that means, it means Madeline and Colin are having a baby! Or Madeline and Billy, since he was the only one of the men in her life who could perform. Madeline sifts through Colin's mail and finds a thin package with the return address being one W.M. Costigan. Inside the package, she finds a copy of the Rolling Stones' Exile on Main Street, a stellar album. She loads the CD into Colin's stereo and hears Frank's voice instead of Mick Jagger's. Madeline then hears Colin's voice instead of Charlie Watts' drumming and Keith Richards' guitar work. Realizing that her boyfriend works for a mob boss, Madeline angrily throws the album at him and snaps that she thought she was the liar. Billy soon calls Colin from 344 Wash, where the two talk about everything that went down. Billy wants his identity back, and Colin agrees to meet him at 344 Wash. He tries to talk to Madeline before leaving, but gets no response. He heads to the rooftop of 344 Wash and is frisked by a gun-wielding Billy. Billy then thwacks the gun across Colin's face and cuffs his hands. Colin tells Billy that he erased his existence and goads Billy into shooting him. Trooper Brown then shows up, and Billy uses Colin as a shield. He tells Brown that Colin is Costello's rat and that he has the documents to prove it. Brown tells Billy to drop his weapon, but Billy reminds Brown that the two know each other, and Brown knows that Billy isn't some unhinged psychopath. Billy drags Colin into the elevator, and once they're alone, Colin asks Billy to just kill him already. Billy says, I am killing you, with the beginnings of a smile on his face. The elevator doors swing open, and Billy is suddenly shot in the head by Trooper Berrigan, who turned out to be another mole of Frank's. Brown comes on down, but is killed by Berrigan when he sees the carnage. Berrigan tells Colin that Costello is going to rat the both of them out. Colin is able to get a hold of Berrigan's gun, ostensibly to wipe off fingerprints, and shoots the other trooper to death. The bodies are carted away, and Colin gives his testimony to the investigating internal affairs cop. He then says he's still interested in submitting Billy Costigan's name for the Medal of Merit. Billy's funeral begins with a heartbroken Madeline watching, standing across from Colin. As the funeral concludes, Madeline walks off alone. Colin tries striking up a conversation with her, but she leaves him in her dust. Yeah, dealing with someone like Esther is easier than dealing with Colin. He's a mess. Colin gets some groceries before heading home, and when he enters his apartment, he is greeted by Dingham, who is wearing latex gloves, booties, and a plastic suit. He is also aiming a gun at Colin, who indifferently says, Okay. Dingham shoots Colin in the face, killing him and avenging both Queen and Anne Billy. Dingham is able to escape from Colin's apartment as we, the audience, spot a rat scurrying up the railing across from the Massachusetts State House. And that wraps up The Departed. Let's move on to the personal review, shall we? Though I haven't seen Infernal Affairs, the Hong Kong film that serves as the original idea, I positively adore The Departed. The Departed is an emotional heavy hitter, and the constancy of Colin and Billy fighting each other while being strung along like marionettes by Frank Costello and, to a lesser extent, Queen and Dingham, it manages to be one of my favorite Martin Scorsese films. I appreciated that he took the setting of this film to Boston, differing from his native New York, and I also appreciated that he took on Leonardo DiCaprio and Matt Damon's acting talents. I mean, after this film, DiCaprio has been in a ton of Scorsese films, including the amazing The Wolf of Wall Street. 
But seeing DiCaprio and Damon face off against each other, with Jack Nicholson breathing down their necks with a scaled back intensity, meaning Frank is the opposite of Jack Torrance, was an acting treat. These three actors complemented each other very well, and I think it'd be a mistake to look past Martin Sheen, Ray Winston, Anthony Anderson, Mark Rolston, David O'Hara, and of course, Vera Farmiga. Each actor brings exactly what is expected of them to create this high-anxiety mob thriller film. Ray Winston and Jack Nicholson have fantastic chemistry as blood brothers who don't bat an eye at the carnage they inflict on a daily basis. Every actor in Frank's crew is able to come off as frightening and suspicious, people who could blow open Billy's plans with just a nod of their heads. Madeline Madden is, is a complex and emotional character, which is absolutely nailed by Vera Farmiga, who is one of my favorite actresses and always turns out an interesting performance. Anthony Anderson brings his usual effusive energy to this role and manages to be one of the cleanest characters in the film, which results in him being brutally murdered. James Badge Dale also has the same level of obedience that he brought as Chase Edmonds in 24, but he, again, he met another gr absolutely gruesome fate. These two smaller characters created a great team that were affected by Colin Sullivan and Billy Costigan as periphery figures. And Martin Sheen absolutely crushes it as Captain Queenan. Captain Queenan is not a paragon of virtue. Though he wants Frank Costello to pay for his misdeeds and face the music, he was still fine with roping in Billy Costigan. And as Billy went through cycles of fear, guilt, and shame, Captain Queenan sort of just tugged him along with the carrot stick of justice dangling in front of Billy's face. However, Queenan grew to care for Billy in a deep way that was similar to how he cared for Sergeant Dingham, and he made the ultimate sacrifice for Billy. Queenan's death as a result is sudden and crushing, someone who might have been pushing Billy to the brink, but also wanted the best possible outcome. Watching the breakdown of Billy Costigan is another topic of this film that I think warrants serious discussion. Billy was described as lace curtain Irish, which means coming from more money and prestige than quote unquote shanty Irish, which rubbed quite a few characters the wrong way, particularly Sergeant Dingham. Though he was still a dyed-in-the-wool Bostonian, he had a set of unique challenges that quickly deflated his chances of becoming a respected cop. He was also dealing with the painful loss of his mother while leading an undercover life, which did not help his depression, anxiety, and fear of being murdered. Billy's intensity and desire for acceptance led to him taking on this undercover role and eventually wound up with him becoming so angry, depressed, and sleep-deprived that he had no choice but to dive in 100%. Still, Billy managed to keep his humanity in check and kept his morals prominent and shiny. Thus, his murder at the hands of Berrigan has a layer of tragedy that we would see with Shakespeare. Though his legacy will not disappear, it is strongly implied that Colin Sullivan's impotent ass did not knock up Madeline Madden, Billy is left as another grease mark on the fight against organized crime. His loss was sudden and unexpected, and though he was avenged, he's still gone. He's still gone and he will never get the chance to start over in a space where he's actually happy and content with his lot in life. On the flip side, Colin Sullivan is Billy's perfect foil. Colin was a kid who also strived to be accepted, but by the dregs of society. He saw a father figure in Frank Costello and was loyal to him to a fault, like a San Andreas sized fault. Colin became a state trooper to cover up his own pension for violence and betrayal. However, he was charming, charismatic, manipulative, and extremely savvy. His silver tongue and easy, handsome Matt Damon smile opened doors that were routinely slammed in Billy Costigan's face. Colin was able to charm his way into a gorgeous apartment, a cushy position, and into the arms of the compassionate and intelligent Madeline Madden, but his dishonest and dirty life wound up with him being unable to perform. And gradually, Colin's charmed life was revealed as a facade to cover up his own complicated feelings and his inner spineless inclinations. Fear is another aspect of this film that I like to discuss. Billy is constantly afraid that his double life will be found out. He covers up this fear with anger. Colin shows the most fear towards the end of the film when Billy is holding him hostage. All he can do is ask Billy to just kill him already. Billy says he is killing Colin because he knows exactly what Colin fears. He fears his reputation melting away and his inner cowardice being on full display. Colin's fear contrasts with Billy's fears, which are being perceived as someone he's not. Billy does not fear the truth as Colin does. Billy fears no one will ever see who he truly is and they will only see his dodgy family reputation and his lack of fitting in. Frank Costello manipulates both these fears and both men into doing his bidding. Frank knew Colin when he was a kid and knows that Colin is willing to do anything to look good in Frank's eyes. Frank knew Billy as the film went on and knew that Billy did not want to be seen as another thug running around the streets of Boston. He knew these two men would do anything to prioritize their true desires, and he used these desires against them. Frank got off mostly scot-free while Colin and Billy were murdered. 
Holland may have been a sociopath, but it was strongly implied throughout the film that he had been molested as a child on top of being groomed as a criminal by Frank. Billy was aggressive and a bit of a look-at-me type, but he was isolated and kept at arm's length by his family, and his real dreams were turned to dust by Dingham and Queenan. Both men had their lives upended by those with power, and neither had the chance to understand how to become happier and more fulfilled. I think analyzing the relationship between Colin, Billy, and Madeline also deserves a little paragraph. Madeline is the combination of two characters in Infernal Affairs, the original film, but her being one big character is an interesting choice. Madeline represents two sides of humanity, living a lie and living the truth. Though a real criminal psychiatrist told Vera Farmiga that Madeline did everything wrong, Madeline is still a psychiatrist who is more than familiar with human impulses. Madeline is not as developed as Naomi Belfort, Karen Hill, the many wild women of After Hours, or Ginger McKenna, but she serves as a representation of Colin and Billy's inner anxieties and horror. When with Colin, Madeline saw his lies on full display. She tried telling him impotence is nothing to be ashamed of, but he pushed her away. When with Billy, Madeline saw how truthful he was. She saw how he was emotionally tortured and how he was constantly afraid of what would happen to him, and as such, they had some emotional sex. Madeline was drawn to Billy because he wasn't a bullshit artist. I've always firmly believed that Madeline was drawn to Colin because she thought he was genuine, and when the cracks of his dishonesty and intense lying reared their ugly heads, she lost all attraction for him. Madeline wanted someone who was real and someone who, rep who represented the true highs and lows of being a human, which she found in Billy Costigan. Madeline walked away from Colin of her own volition, pregnant with Billy's child, and we know that she's going to come out ahead. Though the father of her child is long gone, she knows that she has been with someone who is real, someone who never shied away from acknowledging inner wounds and hidden pain. She did not go back to Colin because she was disgusted and exhausted by his constant lies and his constant exaggeration. Thankfully, she survived the film. Having that affair with Billy was not the right thing to do if you're looking at the concept of adultery, but Colin had essentially ended the relationship by pushing her away and never confiding in her, becoming more absorbed by his criminal duties. Just to be clear, I do not excuse adultery, but I can definitely see Madeline's motivation for pursuing an emotional relationship with Billy. Still, in a perfect world, Madeline would have broken things off and then pursued a relationship with Billy without any strings attached. But Martin Scorsese's characters are rarely innocent. Paul Hackett does come pretty damn close. And because these characters are rarely innocent, they explore the dark depths of human choice and human nature. Frank Costello is another can of worms. He is a caricature of Whitey Bulger, an actual Boston mobster who eventually died in prison. Like Bulger, Costello had been working with the FBI, offering valuable information in exchange for immunity. Unfortunately, this gave him protection from facing the music. My favorite part of this movie is when Billy, flanked by Badfinger's Baby Blue, learns that Frank is an FBI informant. There's a layer of horror and disappointment and devastation in this scene. It really hits home that sometimes the bad guys win. Though Frank eventually met his end at Colin Sullivan's hand, he never faced societal justice for his dozens of murders and assaults. He died quickly, having never faced a fraction of the fear and terror that his victims felt. However, Martin Scorsese's gangster and biographical films usually explore the criminals getting a reduced punishment. It's a stark reminder that life isn't fair, and for many people, this lesson was already apparent. It's not a surprise. Scorsese handles this lack of justice well, and he can truly set the tone for a bleak movie that still manages to be entertaining. The Departed is a masterclass in cat and mouse tension, but the cat in this scenario is not Colin, Colin Sullivan. The cat is Frank Costello, and Billy and Colin are mice who are pitted against each other. Neither man had a great chance to turn out normal, and Frank took advantage of that. He preyed on the two like a cat with a mouse, and he waited until the absolute last minute to strike. And though they're arguably more moral than Hank, Queenan and Dingham also count as cats. They exploited Billy's desire to be one of the cops and pitted him against Frank's mole. Both Frank, Queenan, and Dingham, to an extent, dangled a carrot in front of Colin and Billy's faces, but for different reasons. Frank wanted another loyal so soldier in Colin, and Queenan and Dingham wanted Frank to be arrested by way of using Billy. Though Colin and Billy are constantly hunting and outfoxing each other, in another timeline, they could have been friends. They could have navigated the bullshit craziness of life and held on to each other. I found The Departed to be in the same bleak ending class as Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Full spoilers for that classic, but Whatever Happened to Baby Jane follows two actress sisters who are pitted against each other, and eventually their relationship violently dissolves, with the titular Baby Jane realizing that she and her sister could have been friends rather than treacherous enemies. Though Billy and Colin never come to this conclusion, they have a whole lot in common where this conclusion doesn't feel lazy or stupid. 
It wouldn't be an episode of Vignettes and Vigilantes without a DCAU connection, and we've got a great one here in the form of Mark Ralston. He voiced Firefly in the new Batman Adventures and Justice League, and he's also Drake from Aliens, my all-time favorite movie regardless of genre. He was very good as Delahunt. He had me on edge. And that concludes the synopsis and my personal review of The Departed. I will see you in two weeks with a DCAU episode review. You can find me on Instagram at r.k.musethewriter. I will also upload each of my episodes to my YouTube channel, Vignettes and Vigilantes, so feel free to like and subscribe if you like this content. No judgment here. If some clown gives you static for drinking cranberry juice, just ignore him. Don't get into a fight. It's not worth it. He's just jealous of your deliciously tart beverage. This has been RK Muse with Vignettes and Vigilantes flying off with the other magpies.